What is up, Z family? It's your boy, Z Dog MD. I'm back home at Z Estate, uh, where I just got back from Phoenix. I did a talk for the NHISAC, which is a big cybersecurity conference, brings companies from across the spectrum insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, hospital chains, all together to talk about how they can keep data safe from bad people. And so it was a lot of, you know, chief information officers and cybersecurity experts and um, the head of security for Aetna and other groups were speaking. And it was actually really cool because I learned a lot and then I did my talk and I learned that, wow, even the sort of uh, people on the front lines of the cyber side, like the whole health 2.0 thing, they really deeply resonate with the message of health 3.0, which is this transcendent idea that we should get back to the heart and soul of medicine and use technology to enable it. And that means this. It means the laying of hands, talking, spending time with patients, and using the technology to bring the latest science and data and the idea that 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 will then enable the human relationship instead of replace it or attempt to replace it, which is what happens in Health 2.0. And I think that is a perfect segue into what I wanted to talk about quickly today, which is the, the sordid tale of Dr. Anna Konopka. So many of you have sent me this article and it's been all over the news. She's an 84-ish year old doc in New Hampshire, New London, New Hampshire, some, something like that. And yes, I say New Hampshire because that's what I do. Um, this doctor has been practicing for like 55 years or has had a license for that long and has been uh, reluctant, to say the least, to hop on board the Health 2.0 bandwagon. And that means that even with meaningful use and all the sort of mandates that said, you know what, you need to get electronic health records, you need to do this, you need to do that. In order to get paid, you have to do X, Y, and Z. You have to click these boxes, you have to check these algorithms, you have to uh, understand that the business of medicine is a business and the art of medicine is fading away and it's all about the clicks. Well, she refused to play that game and instead had a small practice where she took care of about 300 odd patients uh, a month or so and would charge $50 per visit, just a flat fee per visit, and was sort of off the insurance grid because she didn't want to get in the computer thing. Well, this led to a bunch of national articles about how she has had to surrender her license, fought to get it back, and then so far has failed in court to get it back. And the premise of why she might lose her license is actually more nuanced than first blush. The way the press kind of feeds it in the headlines is, old doctor refuses to use computer and loses license. And that is the simplest and also probably least complete explanation for what happened. So here's the story as far as I understand it. If anyone knows her, please, or this story, or she's watching and wants to give the Z pack the feed in, although since she doesn't really use computers, I really suspect she's not on Facebook. But if anybody knows her, let me know and we can get the backstory on this because I haven't heard that through my back channels. In any case, the idea was there's an opioid um, registry or electronic tracking uh, prescription thing in New Hampshire, New Hampshire, which has one of the nation's worst problems with prescription drug abuse. And unfortunately, you need to use a computer. So she did not. So she would prescribe opioids without the uh, electronic registry being able to keep track. And as a result, the medical board said, no, 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 there's a regulation in place and you play by it or you don't do this. And unfortunately, she continued to do that. So reading between the lines in the article, a good bit, bit of her patients seemed to be chronic pain patients for whom other docs were not prescribing enough opioids. So she, part of the problem was they were, and there have been complaints dating back to 2014, that, um, and some of these complaints are sealed, so you can't see what is actually going on. But the idea is that maybe opioid overprescribing was part of this, and certainly prescribing it without the right documentation, which is this electronic system. So that was one thing that, that was a problem. The other sort of unsealed complaint was I think it was an asthmatic child. She had recommended to the mother, you know what, you dose the medicine, 
according to these guidelines uh, and didn't give a specific dose. And I and and then something happened and there was a complaint and then her defense was, well, the mom didn't listen to me. <laughs> so let, let's kind of unpack this real quick because there is a part of every doctor practicing, I think, and every frontline healthcare person and a lot of members of the ZPAC who look at the story and go, hey, um, this is a hero, heroin. The, no pun intended since she's overprescribing opioids. This is a heroine who stood up to the ravages of the destruction of our profession in terms of destroying the art and the intuition of medicine by replacing it with click, 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 click. She refuses to play the insurance game. She refuses to get on a computer because she feels, and she was quoted in the article as saying, um, these computers get in the way of between me and the patient. So she basically had a couple file cabinets with all her medical records in this little 160 year old um, house that she does her uh, clinic out of. So not exactly 21st century, but in a way she was saying, I wanna do this old style medicine that I trained to do and that my patients appreciate. 30 of her patients wrote to the medical board supporting her, um, but then there were these complaints. So there are a lot of people who'd be like, yes, this is exactly an example of someone in a very Ann Randian way standing up to the system and saying, I'm not gonna do it and I'm willing to lose my license and then I'll fight to get it back, but even if I don't get it back, I'm not gonna practice in a way that I don't want to. Okay, so that's a valid way to look at it if you're framing it that way. And many of us who are trying to build Health 3.0 understand the validity of the loss of the art of medicine that you wanna bring back in 3.0, which I call repersonalized medicine. So it's back to face-to-face -to -face eye contact with the patient, laying of hands, but technology enabled, population health enabled, team-based, collaborative, and paid in a different way. So no longer fee-for-service, and you gotta figure out, because fee-for-value is a bit of a scam right now, how do you figure out how to get paid on outcomes that matter to your patient? because that's all that matters. What matters to your patient? This, In the end, this is all about our patients. And that's been lost in Health 2.0 where we're trying to treat to an algorithm or a, a randomized controlled trial. And now this woman, this doctor stands up and says, no. So that's a great press story. I bet you the nuance is a little more difficult than that. Because I bet if you could unseal those cases, you might see some evidence of poor decision making, definitely poor record keeping, because she's scratching it out on paper. You might see uh, the what might be considered an inappropriate management of opioid um, dependent patients. Um, it's hard to know, right? And the other thing that she got razzed for in one of the complaints, and, and this, this, this one triggers me a little bit, is that she, I think she had a kid with some tachycardia and she figured it was likely the medicine, the asthma medication he was getting, probably like an albuterol derivative, and um, just said, let's alter the medicine instead of uh, doing what a lot of people would do to cover your butt, which is you know refer to a cardiologist or do something like that. And so she got jazzed by the board for not referring to a cardiologist, which to me, a well-resourced primary care doc practicing at their top of their license can handle those kind of things. And it's exactly that kind of stress that people are like, oh, if I don't refer, I'm gonna get in trouble with the board. That's insane to me. And in 3.0, you have a team that supports you. You can, you can practice at the top of your license, right? And that involves also utilizing nurse practitioners, physician assistants, et cetera, in a team-based practice. So that's one piece. Then you have the opioid piece, which again fits this great national narrative where everyone's talking about. And by the way, I want to say, I want to preface a couple things. I want to say that, you know, just like the pundits on TV, I don't have enough information about this specific case. What What's different about us, CPAC, is that we know medicine, so we can kind of at least use the story that we've read to parse through what are the possible ramifications instead of saying this is what's going on in this case, because we don't know. Right, We don't know what's going on with Dr. Uh, Konopka's uh, life and practice because we're not there and we're not looking at the charts and we're not reviewing it and some of it's sealed. But we can use it as a way to talk about these things so that we can better understand where we stand on these issues and also how it's gonna affect our practice and the future uh, sort of transformation of healthcare that we're all talking about. So she, um, let me pull up your comments while we're at it. Um, the other things that I think are interesting are age. So 84, is year, 84 years old, the press is painting her as this like 
anti-computer Luddite, um, which is true. And at that age, a lot of, you know, a lot of people would say, well, okay, now the decision making gets slower. The faculties are, are different. And we've had this conversation about aging medical practitioners. How do you evaluate them? Uh, should there be certain standards? What do you do about maintenance of certification? And other things like that, which we're going to talk about in January with a special guest that's coming into Vegas to have that discussion. But I can tell you my dad's story. You know, my dad wound down his practice when he was in his 70s, not because he felt incompetent, because he didn't want to get with through meaningful use, spend a lot of money. It costs a lot of money to get an EHR installed. Then you spend tons of time learning it. And already he's spending tons of money and time just getting paid because he has to bill and go through billing apparatuses with multiple different payers. And that whole thing was just becoming so discouraging that he wasn't able to spend time with his patients. So to spend time with his patients, he closed his practice, didn't get the computer, but still learned to use a computer. As I know, he emails me in all caps like every day. And he then went to work for a disability evaluation company where he gets to spend an hour with each patient. And the reason he does it is not to evaluate for disability, although that's what he does. He does it because he gets to spend time with patients who are suffering. He gets to hold their hand, he gets to put his stethoscope on the chest, he gets to look them in the eye and practice true 1.0 type of medicine with the tools and the computer's there and he does the documentation he's supposed to do and he mostly dictates, so he makes it work. So I think this idea that um, you know it, it, it's a zero sum game with that stuff, I, I'm not sure it's entirely true. Also, you know, every person ages differently. Every person remains competent to a different degree. Uh, and I mean, I knew I knew doctors who were ninety who would could just crush younger docs in terms of their clinical decision making and stamina and that kind of thing. So, <laughs> Tom Heineberg, Zubin, it is me or daddy. Why you no call? <laughs> I called you, dad. Okay, I called you this weekend. Um, let's read some comments. Uh, Carol Grantham says, uh, my dad needed a case manager. He needed a lot of things. Opioid abuse is such a common thing nowadays. I see it uh, since I work in the pharmacy daily, Ashley Paris. I know. And again, this again this fits a great national story, so the press has sensationalized it. Otherwise, listen, I get the medical board letter for both California and Nevada, the two states I'm licensed to practice in, um, and the state of internet. By the way, people who send me medical questions just don't. Just don't. You know the minute you start typing, I'm going to either ridicule you or tell you I can't answer a medical question, an individual medical question on Facebook because that is a recipe to lose my license and also commit malpractice because I don't know you from Kane. Okay, that being said, um, the two states I'm licensed in, those uh, board letters, the, the medical board letters that come you know once a month or whatever, they tell you all the disciplinary actions and a way majority of them are bad documentation and opioid uh, problems. So she is in no way an anomaly in that sense, but the press has picked up on it, I think because, and not even because of her age, because there are a lot of old docs who get reprimanded by the board, I think because of the computer thing. So you can see all the articles are like, doctor refuses to use computer. It's really a little more complicated than that, although the computer is definitely a part of it. The interesting thing too is she's a kind of a direct primary care practitioner, so she's just taking cash. She's not. She's off the grid and she's practicing the way she wants to. So for that, you gotta commend her, um, but it's complicated. And then the patients, you know, it's really about the patients. Now some of the patients they interviewed were like, chronic pain, chronic back pain patients who are getting a lot of opioids and they're like, I don't know where I'm gonna get my opioids. We did a show on this, so I would refer you to this, are we killing chronic pain patients? Um, but again, it makes you go, hmm, all right? And and this is a massive problem in this country. We've talked about it before. I won't rehash it all here today. So Logan Stewart, um, our Logan Stewart, I tried putting Burger King honey sauce on it and it made it worse. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, it itches when I scratch it. So Logan's got a lot of complaints, um, most of them psychogenic. Can you look at it? Oh, I see, Logan, you're asking me medical questions. You know what? For you, Logan, because we have a doctor-patient relationship, because I've already done several rectals on you, um, and the turn and cough, that was just for sport. Uh, I will answer your question, but I'll have to do it offline because of HIPAA. Uh, guys, I think, <laughs> now he's asking about a mole on his butt. Um, let's see here. Dr. Anna sounds like a live free or die kind of doc. Uh, Megan Kraljevich, isn't that a new, isn't that the New Hampshire uh, slogan? 
live free or die, it's perfect. It's perfect. By the way, if you haven't seen the parody of, uh, of uh, New York State of Mind, uh, I did EHR State of Mind. This guy in New Hampshire did New Hampshire State of Mind. It's really funny. Um, okay, guys, I think on that note, the one thing I want to say, I'm using a new mic right now uh, that I have on this weird thing. I wonder if I can actually pick it up. Ooh, because I've kind of jimmy rigged. Whoa, I've jimmy rigged the whole thing. So, hey, it kind of works. It kind of works. Oh, catch up. There we go. Um, so let me know how it sounds. Tell me if it sounds worse or better than the usual thing. And the last thing I wanted to say is um, tomorrow we're going to have a special guest, uh, Dr. Haley Fisher-Wright. So she wrote a book uh, with another guy, uh, Logan something or other, David Logan, called Tribal Leadership, which is one of my favorite books on sort of, uh, we talked about it before, this sort of teal thinking and kind of transforming business and management into something much more connected, much how much like how we're trying to do 3.0. She's a physician and the head of the Medical Group Management Association. And we're going to talk about her new book, Back to Balance, which is really about what we're talking about, balancing the art, the science, and the business of medicine. It's out of balance. Right now, it's all about the business and some of the science and not so much about the art. So how do we bring that back? We're going to talk about that to Tomorrow. On that note, guys, I'm going to hit you with a Facebook uh, ad on the way out because that helps us raise money for Logan's butt rash. Uh, watch it. See if what it feeds you because Facebook is trying to tailor these ads specifically to you. And you may not get anything, but if you get an ad, uh, it'll make you think, hmm, what have I been surfing that would make me get this herpes cream ad? All right, guys. I love you. Peace. Hope you saw something. We out.